So welcome if you've just joined us. We're um, about to launch into this evening's uh, presentation. So we're just waiting a few more minutes for the latecomers to join us. Um, and then we will, without further ado, uh, blast off with uh, the webinar. Okay, uh, we'll make a start and if people come subsequently, they can uh, join in later in the proceedings. So first of all, thank you very much to our co-hosts, um, Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Scott York and Holland and Hart in the United States. My name is Adrian Bradley. I'm a partner at uh, Cleveland Scott York in the United Kingdom based in the Reading office and my practice focuses mainly on healthcare related innovations. And it's great pleasure to introduce as co-speaker Lauren Hulse from Holland and Hart in Salt Lake City. Lauren is a very dear friend and excellent speaker and fantastic practitioner on his side of the water. So the topic we are going to cover tonight, as said on the introductory slide, is COVID-19 diagnostics, intellectual property strategies for rapid development and launch on both sides of the Atlantic. So I hope that is what you're expecting. Um, so I'll give an overview and background to the current situation and the needs of um, the, the, current, the, the current crisis is presenting. I'll outline the patentability situation for diagnostic technologies in Europe and talk briefly about uh, enforcement in the UK. I'll talk about um, strategy, uh, how you might wish to adapt your patenting strategy in view of the different opportunities that the markets present. And then I will talk about market entry. And then we'll hand over to Lauren and I think the bulk of his talk will be devoted to patentability issues in the US. So obviously we are in the midst of what is in most of our lifetimes an unprecedented situation. And the need for diagnostics is urgent and immediate. So track and trace is held out as the cornerstone of many national strategies to deal with the current coronavirus crisis. So the UK, for example, has a, a target of 100,000 tests per day, which it is even meeting on occasions. There are major drawbacks in um, testing. Uh, there is a huge problem of scale. So existing uh, technologies are simply not available in sufficient quantities and at sufficient scale to deal with the number of assays that need to be run. The existing molecular based protocols are slow, sometimes it takes two or three days to generate results, and there is an urgent need for point of care diagnostics, for example, which are predicted to be a game changer in dealing with any future resurgence of the COVID-19 virus. Tests based on detection of antigens and antibodies are developing rapidly and these will soon be brought to the fight. And in the future, we can predict that prognostic tests, uh, predictive tests and monitoring tests will all be needed in assistance with um, selecting the best therapy for people suffering from the virus. So there are a number of challenges for those involved in developing diagnostics. First and foremost in everyone's mind, of course, is to deal with the emergency and save lives. That is um, the be all and end all at the moment. People are desperate for new, thera new therapeutic and diagnostic solutions. And as patent attorneys, it's, we have our role to play in ensuring that these new technologies come to the market and are as widely adopted as possible. Diagnostic companies cannot, however, lose sight of the fact that they have a business model to uh, maintain, build and preserve. And the present 
uh, predicament will not last forever and they need to make sure that they have a viable business once this is all over. Of course, they need to avoid a public relations disaster. So um, we don't want lawyers storming into hospitals, slapping injunctions on um, people who are administering life-saving uh, therapies. And businesses want to thrive in a post-pandemic world. So an IP strategy that supports all of these goals is going to be essential. And what is interesting about the diagnostic space is that uh, very different legal landscapes prevail in Europe and the US. And that's why I think it will be very interesting for us to look at those side by side in this session. And we can draw some comparisons and um, learn some lessons about uh, how we can proceed on both sides of the pond. So, as I've said, the need is urgent and immediate. The, the number of tests that are predicted to be run is unprecedented on um, anything like as short a scale. And governments have issued urgent calls for not just uh, res uh, respirators and other uh, medical devices, but improved diagnostic kits as well. And if you are looking to bring one of these tests to the market, there is a risk that third party intellectual property will be infringed. And that's a risk you just cannot ignore. Okay, it's up to you how you decide to deal with it, but you cannot afford to ignore it. So some owners, not just in the diagnostic sphere, but in therapeutics as well, have announced intention not to enforce the, their IP, but that is, um, that is by no means a blanket policy. And the litigation risk will remain when the immediate crisis abates. So in the United Kingdom, the Limitation Act provides for a six year term after which intellectual property causes cannot be brought, um, but this risk will remain. So we'll be talking a little bit about how we can deal with that. So I'd like first to talk about the opportunities for obtaining patents for diagnostic technologies in Europe. So in Europe, the situation at the European Patent Office is relatively stable, I would say, and predictable with regard to obtaining patents for diagnostic methods and also for patenting of genes and other products of nature. So although this is not intended to be a law lecture, I think there are two instruments of the European Patent Convention which uh, need um, our attention, although probably a lot of us are already familiar with them. So there are two classes of entity uh, which the European Patent Office does not grant patents. There are entities which the EPO deems not to be inventions, including programs for computers, presentations of information. And there are a second category of entity which the European Patent Office concedes are indeed inventions, but they are not suitable subject matter for obtaining a patent. And for our purposes, the most interesting of these is Article 53C, which tells us that methods of treatment of the human or animal body by surgery or therapy and diagnostic methods practiced on the human or animal body um, shall not be granted uh, patents. And that there is this proviso um, substances or compositions for use in those methods uh, may be patented um, and I will talk relatively little about that although I would divert at this stage to say that uh, diagnostic agents uh, are, um, are patentable so imaging agents and uh, that's that type of entity. Um, also, the um, Biotechnology Directive, as enshrined in Rule 29 of the European Patent Convention, tells us that an element isolated from the human body or otherwise produced by means of a technical process, including sequence or partial sequence of a gene, may constitute a patentable invention, even if the structure of that element is identical to that of a natural element. Okay, so we've got these two um, pieces in hand. We know that um, diagnostic methods practiced on the human or animal body are not patentable, but we can get a patent for products of nature, including genes. So 
uh, because I'm um, quite a visual person, I always like to have a diagram, you know, preferably a Venn diagram, which tells me how things work. So uh, in this slide, I've conceptualized Article 53. So methods of diagnosis, um, which are practiced on the human and animal body, represent the overlap of the orange and the light blue circle and are deemed not patentable. Sometimes we have a situation where a method of diagnosis is inextricably linked to a surgical method, and uh, those are also um, unpatentable. So the guiding cases before the European Patent Office are um, G1 of 04, a decision of the Enlarged Board of Appeal. So a diagnostic method, this decision tells us, is excluded only if it comprises all of the following steps. So step one, which is a data collection phase. Step two, comparison of these data with standard values. Step three, identification of a deviation from a normal or desired state. And step four, which is the actual diagnosis, attribution of this deviation to a particular clinical picture. And furthermore, any steps of a technical, that is as opposed to a purely intellectual um, nature, um, must be practiced on the human or animal body to be excluded. So this is usually the data collection step. So to illustrate this, um, a doctor taking someone's temperature would be step one. A comparison of that with the known standard um, would be step two. The identification of someone having an elevated temperature would be the detection of a symptom. Um, so that'll be step three and the attribution of that to a influenza infection, for example, would be step four. So in order to be excluded, the method has to have all four of those steps and one of them must be practiced on the human or animal body. G1 of 07 is also relevant and it defines what is a uh, prohibited uh, surgical method. It involves a substantial physical intervention which requires uh, professional care and expertise and substantial risk even when carried out by said persons. Um, the products of nature, this uh, goes back to um, this T decision, which I've put here, which it relates to the patent in respect of relaxin by the Howard Florey Institute. And that was opposed by a number of parties, including um, the coalition of green parties of the European um, Parliament. And it was a it was uh, confirmed in that case that um, products of nature, including genetic material, uh, were patentable subject matter, matter. And that is enshrined in the European Biotechnology Directive, which um, all EU member states are um, uh, have incorporated into their national law and is also part of European law in the form of Rule 23 of the European Patent Convention. So drawing all these uh, threads uh, together, um, what type of thing is, represents allowable subject matter in, uh, at the EPO? So data gathering methods uh, are perfectly um, patentable subject matter. So a, ma a method of measuring someone's temperature using an infrared device, provided it fulfills all the other criteria of the EPC is perfectly patentable subject matter. So the decision I've put here relates to a, a method for measuring at least one parameter of a sample, um, illuminating the light and performing at least two spectroscopic measurements. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't comprise a full uh, diagnosis in the sense of G1 of 04. So it is deemed to be patentable subject matter. Imaging methods, which do not result in a, uh, a diagnosis within the meaning of G1 of 04, are perfectly patentable. And I've put an example there which relates to administration of a, um, a polarized gas to someone's lungs. 
imaging the, res uh, the resultant um, uh, spectro spectroscopic signal and uh, providing an image in that way, which was deemed patentable subject matter. So in vitro diagnostic methods, uh, which are possibly of most interest, um, and, and it is no coincidence, the T decision I've put there, which relates to the University of Utah uh, stroke myriad uh, case for um, determining predisposition of uh, someone to breast cancer. And neither is a coincidence that I have uh, selected the uh, following patent, uh, 1115403. So methods for determining efficacy of treatment are also uh, patentable subject matter. And uh, last on the list, uh, a virus, an antigen, an antibody, a spike protein, and an in vitro method of detection or of any or all of the above are fully patentable subject matter within Europe. And I'll give an example of um, these type of claims uh, in a minute. So for those interested, I'm not proposing to go through these in detail now, but I'm contrasting two decisions that I imagine Lauren will be talking about, the Prometheus decision and the Myriad decision. And these are the counterpart claims that were allowed in Europe. So the pieces, I've under, the words I've underlined there, take it out of being practiced on the human or animal body. So obviously it relates to an in vitro method in the Prometheus case and uh, a method of diagnosing predisposition to breast cancer uh, comprising determining inner tissue sample. So it's not practiced on human or animal body, rather on an in vitro sub, um, sample. So these are fully patentable um, methods in Europe. So what I thought would be illustrative is just to run through some granted claims of um, a patent directed to a coronavirus and diagnostic methods directed towards it. So this was a, um, the coronavirus in question is um, uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS. And what is interesting here is the wide variety of independent aspects of the invention which are patentable. So not only can you get a patent directed to the RNA virus uh, per se, if you have enough characterizing uh, information in the claim, you can get um, a patent to a cell comprising a virus, an antigen, antibody directed to a protein according to um, uh, one of the previous claims, a method for identifying a viral isolate as MERS-COVID, a um, method for virologically di diagnosing an infection, and a method for serologically diagnosing an infection. So not only can you get a patent directed towards all the, um, all the ingredients that you need, you can get um, robust protection to uh, methods for making the diagnosis. So it's all well and good to say that we can trot off to the European Patent Office and obtain patent protection for our diagnostic invention, but uh, can we enforce that in the courts of the member states of uh, the uh, EPO? And the answer is an affirmative yes, as was attested by the case of Illumino versus TDL, which was handed down last July by the High Court. So Illumina su successfully asserted one of their patents relating to non-invasive uh, prenatal blood testing um, against TDL. And the patent related to a key step in the NIPT process, which was the separation of fetal DNA from maternal DNA. And TDL in their defense um, challenged the validity, as you would expect, of uh, the patent and challenged whether it in fact constituted patentable subject matter. 
and they argue that maternal blood and its contents are naturally occurring products and uh, it was tantamount to a uh, discovery. So this was roundly rejected uh, by uh, the judge and the patent was found both valid and infringed. So after that, uh, admittedly, whistle-stop look at EPO uh, practice, the, le the take-home lessons are that the EPO grants patents in respect of naturally occurring products, including genes, and they use inter alia in, diagnos in diagnosis subject to certain rules. Patents of re in respect of diagnostic technologies are enforceable in major European jurisdictions, and patents in respect of other coronaviruses and uh, aspects of um, relating to them, elements of them and diagnosis of them have been granted by the European Patent Office. Well, so what? Well, the next bullet point is the so what? Um, the global diagnostics market is uh, estimated to be worth 40 to 45 billion. Um, the US uh, obviously is the largest single market, but Europe is uh, not that far behind with a market size of uh, 14 billion. And Europe for diagnostic technologies represents a valuable standalone opportunity. Okay, so we can get patents in Europe and we probably think it's worth having a position, a proprietary position in the European market if we're in this game. So how can we how can we deal with that, particularly if um, you are starting out from the US? If you are a diagnostics research company based in the US, how do you take advantage of this op opportunity that Europe offers? So even if uh, you've lost the will uh, to live domestically for patenting, um, I would um, consider at least the following approach. So after you filed your US provisional application, um, you can obtain a foreign filing license, which um, I believe can be obtained relatively quickly in a matter of uh, weeks. Yeah, thanks Lauren. And we can file a UK application using the um, same um, specification. And we, after all, speak a, uh, a version of your language. Uh, it's relatively inexpensive to do so and for your filing fee uh, you can uh, get a search for a little over 200 pounds and this application will give you uh, a good um, the, the search quality at the uk office is very, very good and um, it will give you a good preliminary indication of patentability in europe and a position in one of the uh, top three markets uh, in uh, in Europe. And then once you're armed with this information, you can proceed in the usual way with your PCT or EP application. So of course, other strategies are possible, but this is one that I have found successful with uh, universities in uh, the US and elsewhere. So, uh, that, that's one side of the coin. You've obtained a proprietary position, which is uh, which is great. But the pressing need at the moment is to bring a test to the market to save people's lives and control and uh, lessen the uh, impact of the pandemic. So, as I mentioned, some owners have announced their intention not to in enforce, but you must be aware of the fact that uh, well, when you bring a new product to the market, you are at risk of infringing other people's intellectual property and your appetite for risk dictates the amount of freedom, freedom to operate that you will need to undertake. So if you've got a massive uh, evil Knievel type appetite for risk, then you know just blast away, don't worry about it at all. But some, um, you, at least you need to be aware of the risk that you are undertaking. Now, in addition to all the normal defenses to infringement that, um, that are familiar to us, um, an interesting possibility has 
uh, arisen as a result not just of the present situation but of some um, case law that um, was recently handed down in the UK. So section, section 55 of the UK Act relates to uh, services or use of patented inventions for the services of the Crown and it was until recently a very little used provision of the UK Act. And what it says is under three specific circumstances, defense, uh, specified drugs and medicines and atomic energy, uh, the government can authorize uh, or perform itself acts which would otherwise uh, constitute an infringement of the patent. So, and such authorization can be uh, retrospective. So these, uh, this is a pretty broad government use um, provision. Another section of the Act tells us that during any period of emergency, these, um, these rights are broadened. So um, any person authorised by the, the guys under the Section 55 for the maintenance of supplies and services essential to the life and health of the community, uh, securing of supplies and services essential to the well-being of the community um, are exempted from patent infringement. There are other provisions of the Act which tell you that um, you will get paid if your patent is made the subject of a, um, of a crown use order. So it's obviously a pretty drastic step where the government uh, sequesters private property for its own use. So I think we'd all be annoyed if um, the government commandeered our uh, cars or our houses to deal with an emergency no matter how severe. So it wasn't very widely used and the case law precedent was uh, thin on the ground. <clears throat> but recently there has been a case um, in the um, telecommunications field. So this related, uh, the patent in question related to a method of controlling access to a mobile network. And under certain circumstances, it allowed um, devices in a privileged group, uh, e.g. emergency services, to access uh, um, certain channels of, of the network um, immediately to give, to give, to, for them to be given uh, priority. So uh, network providers in the UK are obliged to provide um, this service, um, such, a, uh, such a facility. It was only implemented or tested occasionally. And it was acknowledged by all parties that the, this patent was essential to the working of the, um, of the technology. And um, but, uh, Vodafone were, have, were found to have infringed IPC com, uh, IPCOM's patent, which was moreover found to be valid. And they'd raised a Section 55 defence. So the patentee argued that the Crown use should be construed narrowly to the three specific circumstances mentioned, defense, drugs, and atomic energy. But the judge applied a rather broad application and asserted that use need not be directly for the benefit of the Crown, but use by or for the protection of the Crown services, such as the police was covered. So this has um, opened up the possibility where in response to a government call for um, health related technology, um, in particular diagnostics and therapeutics, if one is responding to um, a, a call from um, the, national, the UK national government, it may be a valid defense to patent infringement. So you will still have to pay a, um, a fee of some sort but um, it uh, should be more um, quantifiable and predictable. Um, so this is obviously going to be relevant where the problem is one of scale. So if there are, if there is simply not, not enough chloroquine or uh, respirators available on the market, um, I was going to make a Donald Trump joke there, Lauren, but uh, <laughs> I restrain myself. <laughs> Um, if, it, if it's something that's known and old and we just need more of it, 
then it's a, I think it, it is more of a viable defense than it was. But for bringing newer pro new products to the market, um, so point of care diagnostics, antibody tests, this kind of thing, the rate determining step is not gonna be infringement of somebody else's patent. It's going to be a regulatory approval uh, to get to bring those to the market. So I think it's unlikely to be significant in, um, in cutting edge technologies. Now, interestingly, uh, the UK government has um, offered specific indemnities in, uh, in at least one case. So uh, for the supply of rapidly manufactured ventilator systems, the um, uh, HM government issued an indemnity in relation to claims brought against suppliers of equipment uh, to produce such equipment to, the address, uh, to address the pandemic. And this covered product liability and intellectual property infringement liabilities. So it is, it is possible in order to speed things to the market in, um, in this situation or subsequent similar situations that uh, the government will use this as a tool for um, uh, supplying the market more quickly than would otherwise be possible. Okay, so that's all I had to um, say on the European side. So I will now shut up and let Lauren um, inform us about uh, his own uh, native jurisdiction. Thanks, Adrian. We'll see how well I can juggle screens here. Um, looks promising. Okay, looks like that's come across. Uh, again, thanks, Adrian. I'm, I'm grateful for the, the intro and, and grateful for the background on your side. I want to kind of issue a, a blanket apology in case on my end it is, it is middle of the day. Uh, I have experienced Zoom calls in this household where violin practice was ongoing by two different children and then you know, the smoke alarm goes off in the kitchen. Uh, so you, you, you never know what you're going to get on this end. I'm grateful in any case for the chance to, to share and hope that I have a few things that can be of, of use and value and would welcome questions either after I speak or later if they're available, if they come up. Um, briefly, as an outline of where I want to go, current situation, this side of the pond is a little troubled uh, as, far as, as far as our legal position uh, for patenting and diagnostics. There is significant work that needs to be done to try to get around current case law which is trouble. Uh, there, there has been clamor for change, but I'm, I'm afraid that the, the volume of that noise has definitely dropped uh, in, in view of all of the effort that's been instead put into trying to pass stimulus bills and other things to try to take care of immediate needs. And then in the meantime, I wanna walk through some strategies and opportunities that do exist right now in the, in the US for covering yeah, your methods either in creative ways or covering aspects of them that will still allow you to capture value and protect what you would be worried about. Um, you'll begin to see similar names to what Adrian mentioned, maybe even before, yeah, maybe even before I jump into the case law to, to, to speak to the trouble in the waters. It's not just the case law right now. Uh, I've been amazed by the amount of struggle and anxiety about intellectual property from the very beginnings of uh, the U.S.'s response to the outbreak. Just in my, in my location. Sorry, Lauren, I, you're, um, I think your microphone's cutting, cutting in and out a bit. Oh, no, that's not good. Let me see what I can do on that. Is that any better, Adrian? Let me give that a go. Um, again, just in this situation in my state, we've seen a lot of strife over intellectual property from day one. We have a local company, Biofire Diagnostics, that's a, a very serious presence in the molecular diagnostics field that began work on, on, on a COVID-19 test and almost immediately was sued for its work by interestingly, an investment entity that had purchased patents from, of all uh, 
of all lovely companies, Theranos, uh, thus triggering just landslides of criticism and anger, uh, best among them being from Mark Lemley, who chairs the Stanford Law School Program in Law and Technology uh, and Science, who says, bad, a biotech patent troll, worse, seeking injunctions, even though product's not on the market, we're still using patents that got, patents that got from Theranos, Worst, trying to shut down a COVID-19 testing. This could be the most tone-deaf IP suit in history. Uh, the suit was filed by Fortress Investment, who is now backing away from that strategy a little bit, saying it, it hopes to license technologies to people, but that's yet to be seen how that will play out. Similarly, uh, on the contact tracing side of things, my state has issued an app for smartphones to allow individuals to voluntarily show their location, help us to figure out what, what interactions there might be um, with people who are infected. And they were immediately, that, that news was immediately eclipsed by another lo local company announcing that they own the rights to that technology and would be happy to license it to, to the state's uh, app generating company as well as others. So I'm very curious to see indeed how some of this plays out um, because again, strife from day one. Now, again, looking to the case law, we've been in a, in a rather strange place in the life sciences space for patent and diagnostic inventions for some years, beginning back when the Supreme Court looked at Mayo versus Prometheus, finding that many most diagnostic tests in their, in their, in their normal form in claims are indeed unpatentable, uh, not eligible as, as, as a patentable subject matter. Then we had the Myriad Genetics case, again, a local company here for, for us in Salt Lake City, uh, where Myriad was sued and some of, some of its key intellectual property was taken out with the finding that isolated genes are not eligible for patentable subject matter either. Um, and then, uh, again, more work. And I've got the wrong date somehow on Athena here, forgive me. Um, this Athena case that, that hit, that's been percolating for quite some time and then came up with a petition for cert to the Supreme Court just, just last year and early this year, the Supreme Court denied cert for it as well as a stack of other uh, suits that were ch challenging and trying to find the edges of this new doctrine around patent eligibility that the Supreme Court is putting out that honestly, the courts are struggling with. The Federal Circuit, I've never seen an opinion like this where there were every, every judge uh, felt like they needed further clarity and further information from the Supreme Court and that this was an issue that the Supreme Court needed to take up. And the Supreme Court said no and walked away. So that unfortunately is, is the situation where we're looking at things that are very, very closely related that yet are across the line from each other. Isolated nucleic acids, again, purified, stripped from their, from their uh, normal position in the genome, isolated, pulled out, purified are deemed a product of nature, where synthetic nucleic acids that may differ in very, very minor, very uh, subtle in some cases ways, are deemed patent eligible. Uh, diagnostic methods are labeled as, as an attempt to claim a natural law, even if that law was previous or, or law or, or correspondence was previously not understood or not uh, seen those are ineligible for patenting, where methods of treatment, as we'll, we'll see a little bit later in my slides, uh, that can be incredibly related, are clearly patentable and defended by the, by the courts currently, um, as are laboratory procedures that are just claims that may be styled slightly differently, but cover very similar, again, subject matter. Okay. Um, Aftermath. In current and recent years, there's been a lot of work, again, trying to find edges, the edges of this doctrine. Where, where do we, what does it cover? Where do we get? What, what can we get and what, what can't we? Uh, Ariosa versus Sequinom. This, Adrian, you mentioned the European, I believe, equivalent of, of this, where it was a prenatal blood test uh, that, that was found by the courts to amount to just an application of a natural phenomenon and fail the Mayo test. Anything where you're, you're running tests on the specimen, noticing a correlation with a condition and di diagnosing the condition as was done in Ariosa that failed. 
similar in Cleveland, in this Cleveland Clinic case, but I want to show you the claim at issue here, where what was claimed was a method of detecting elevated uh, me, myeloperoxidase levels in a patient sample. You look at the claim limitations, you're obtaining the sample, you're detecting an elevated MPO mass in the cytoplasmic sample, comparing it to a control, and then and, and using that again, making a diagnosis. Uh, problematic, insufficient, non-patentable. If you look a little further, you see some that have somehow made it around the doctrine. I wanted to stop here and look a little bit more closely at these some of these claims because I think they, they will point a little to what we want to talk about more a little bit later where there are options and there are opportunities for exploring claims still even in this condition. Cells Direct. This was an interesting case and directed to a, a, my first loss, a natural product, where it's a method of preparing multiple, multiply frozen hepatocytes. And if you look at the claim here, what's done is, is, is you're claiming the method. It's a, it's a preparation of multi cryopreserved hepatocytes capable of being frozen and thawed at least twice. And functional limitation there that's it doesn't so, sorry Lauren I, th I think you just need to um, speak up or, or be a bit closer to the microphone perhaps no I can do I that cut, you're cutting you'll in get and out. a closer view of, of me which is not a positive but <laughs> a shot yeah no, that, Thanks, I think Adrian. it's fine when you when you speak up it's um uh, when you, when your voice drops or you, you you drift away but it kind of cuts out mm, no thanks for letting me know that's helpful so to back up on this again, you're preparing a, a preparation of multi cryo preserved hepatocytes. If you look at the method steps, you're taking a biological product, the hepatocytes, you're freezing and thawing them. You're running a separation test, recovering separated viable hepatocytes, and then cryo preserving them. That's it. Any alteration, I guess, could have been done by the, by the freezing step, but uh, it's at its foundation, a natural, a natural, in my in my mind, a natural preparation that has not been altered that much in this case by the hand of man, but was found to be sufficient and defensible claim-wise by the courts. So this is one thing to think about. Here the court looked and said, well, this I'm going to treat this as not a method of di not diagnosis. I'm going to treat this as a method of preparation of something that may be closely related, even though Again, contrary in, in my mind to some of the some of the analysis of, of the Myriad case, this is largely a natural product that's been separated only only subject to separation and freezing steps. Let's look at the other one, Vanda Pharmaceuticals. This one I think also gives very good advice to us. Where if you look at the first couple of claims, you see that the first couple of steps are again as you'd seen in troubled claims before, determining whether the patient is a poor metabolizer and then performing a genotyping typing assay. And then the, the next couple steps take it further, just one step to say, if you've noticed a correlation that they're a poor metabolizer, then you take the additional step of administering iloperidone to the patient in a specific dosage, less than the 12 mix per day or less. Or in the case that they don't have that genotype, then you can give it a greater than 12 mix per day up to an upper threshold. Again, interesting here, you have all of the diagnostic steps in the claim. They've just gone one step further to add a method of administration so that it becomes a method of treatment claim found to be patentable, found to be free and clear. Uh, this case was also taken, put up for review by the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court declined to, to revisit this finding which upheld these claims. So that's definitely a strategy to, to look at. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in more detail in a couple of minutes. Um, I've mentioned winds of change. Even as early as, as this time last year, there were pressures felt to try to revisit this law. I was excited to see some movement in this space, but disappointed that it floundered. Um, the bullets I, I show here, I don't know if you can see the cursor, where I talked about the provisions of Section 101 and no implicit or other judicially created exceptions. Those are taken from a proposed bill. 
it was, this was a bipartisan bill, had fairly decent support, which was nice to see. We don't see a lot of bipartisanship right now, I'm afraid. Um, and you see they wanted to push for construction of 101 in favor of, of eligibility as opposed to in favor of exceptions, which I think they see the Supreme Court is doing. And then second, try and get rid of any judicially created exceptions to that subject matter eligibility set out in the laws. Unfortunately, however, this, this ran aground with, with contention uh, in the current Congress. And again, even in, even in view of, of the anxiety, difficulty, and, and people will argue about uh, missteps in COVID-19 testing, there's been little ability to revive that effort for change. So I think the safest strategy at this point is to expect the law to stay the same, um, unfortunately. So until or unless it changes, because again, we're in a situation where the courts have declined to change all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has declined to revisit this law. Congress is currently unable or unwilling to do so. We need to bend and, and figure out the ways, ways around it and ways to cover valuable technology uh, in the meantime. So one, as set out in, in Vanda case, consider taking your claims just that one step further and turning them into methods of treatment claims. You don't need to see a whole lot. I'll, I'll walk through some that have granted recently so that you can see detail. And then second, take hints from the Myriad decision where Myriad tried to leave things open to say, hey, look at other aspects of what you're doing. Other methods of manipulating genes in that case Myriad court thought would be patentable. Further, new applications or uses of those natural sequences, those would clearly be patentable as well. And that, as we discussed, anything altered in those sequences would be patentable. Looking at um, the method of treatment claims first, here's one that recently issued, where you see obtaining a sample, performing an assay, and then identifying the diagnostic step identifying the patient as having one or more nucleotide transversions in the coding sequences. Again, you've, you've got a diagnostic claim for all intents and purposes until the very last, where you're administrating an, effect, administering an effective amount of the immune checkpoint inhibitor. Once again, the inhibitor itself isn't new. It's Here it's identifying the patient population would benefit. It's a diagnostic claim couched as a method of treatment claim. So I've, and I've seen several that have gone this route where it's just a matter of adding that additional step or two to turn your method of, of diagnosis into a method of treatment. Uh, here's another one. This was an incredibly short claim. Uh, method for treating an autoimmune disease in a subject in need thereof comprising first determining the subject has an HLA profile that does not include the, the specific HLA alien. Um, in this case, because Patients specific to that allele would, would, uh, were much more subject to potential damage from a class of drugs. This infliximab. Disclosure notes, you know, this, it's not that infliximab is new. This has been around for quite some time and used broadly, but that they'd identified a patient population that shouldn't receive it. So here you're diagnosing a population for uh, non-treatment, as it were, but styling the claims as method of treatment claims for treating people so long as they do not include the specific allele identified in the diagnostic step. Next, we need to back up. I think for many years it got, it was easy to just look and drop the method of diagnosis into the claims and take that, assuming that that was what would carry most value. Now we need to back up a little bit and consider each step of the method. Do you produce anything new? in the steps of, of the method. If you're taking a patient sample, if you're one of, or any of your reagents new or novel, and could they be pursued independently? But two, in complexing them or in mixing them, are you creating something new that you could also patent as a potential intermediate that would, that would be a, a meaningful way of getting in front of um, potential competitors? Two, are there any steps that you're doing that one, are, are novel, but two, would have been taught against in the art previously? So great, that may be another uh, intermediate method that you could protect instead of a full, full diagnostic method, uh, that specific step. And we'll get to why uh, cases where that's been patentable 
in just a second. And lastly, if, if you think that, say you, this is a, a large disclosure, part of, part of other things, but you have methods of diagnose, diagnostic methods that you'd love to cover, disclose them, put them in your specification. Put them in your specification uniquely, separately describe them in if you're going to, if you're going to cover them as far as a method of treatment or something else, but put them in there. One, you, you gain protection from others patenting that same thing, but two, you leave yourself open with disclosure should you have a continuation that's, that's viable and pending if and when the law is changed. Because I, I, I can't believe that the law will stay as it is indefinitely. I do see further movement coming. I think we're just gonna have to be patient and see our way through the current crisis. Um, some examples of this, this is this again, the Illumina case that, that Adrian referenced. I thought this was very interesting that in, in, in my mind, the federal circuit uh, bent, bent over backwards to make sure that this did not come up and be classified as a diagnostic claims case. We'll look at the claim in a second. In the, in the opinion, they said this is not a diagnostic case and it's not a method of treatment case is a method of preparation case. Think back to cells direct, we talked about a little bit earlier than hepatocyte cells. Here, I think they tried to take a similar tack where they, they looked at the claims and said, no, you're, you're not conducting any diagnosis here. You're instead preparing a DNA fraction from pregnant female that, that's useful for analyzing a genetic locus that may be involved in a fetal chromosome operation. But that's, that's all the preamble. They look at the method steps to say we're extracting, we're producing a fraction, and that fraction then has the property of comprising plurality of genetic loci, and then that which can then be analyzed. There's no diagnosis as part of this claim, so they found it as a method of preparation of thus patent eligible and free and clear of, of the prohibition, which was again heartening as a, as a possibility for moving forward. Summary, and I just want to summarize, I guess, recommendations and where I think we ought to go at this point. One, do continue to monitor the, the, the legal situation, get updates from US counsel, uh, watch the law, because this continues to change and you have a federal circuit that is hungry for that change, uh, anxious for clarification from the Supreme Court and who has shown an appetite to want to either push cases up to the Supreme Court to try to get answers, or two, construe the law and construe claims as, as carefully and narrowly as possible to find uh, ways around to say, nope, this is a method of treatment, or this is a creation of an intermediate, this is a creation of a new thing as in Cells Direct, or a method of preparation as in Illumina, thus giving you an out and giving you a window for patentability. Uh, two, do continue to watch for that legislative change. I am hopeful that as, as the crisis ebbs Hopefully, it may take us a couple of years, but I'm hopeful that we will see change in that timeline. And then lastly, take some of Adrian's advice here. Look globally in your applications and keep that global perspective. Enable the diagnostic methods, pursue them, get the claims where they're feasible and where they're viable, but then take other creative approaches here in the US to get coverage for those methods, be it through transforming them slightly into methods of treatment, seeking coverage of intermediates or compounds that are novel as part of the process, or seeking coverage to intermediate steps, and intermediate step or steps where you've created something new, as again in Illumina or Cells Direct. So those are the initial thoughts. Um, Adrian, I'll turn the screen back to you and we can hit any questions, comments that have come up. Great. Uh, thanks, Lauren. That was, uh, that was excellent. So what I'd like to do now is throw the floor open to the audience. If you look at the bottom of your uh, Zoom interface, you can see there's a Q&A box there. Um, so if you type questions into that, then uh, Lauren and I will um, uh, attempt to uh, deal with them. I was interested, Lauren, in particular in the in the Bander case. So it seems like the courts are either wanting extra steps or they're wanting less steps. So they're wanting either a kind of personalized medicine 
uh, patient stratification and a treatment, which can include a diagnostic step, or the, the steps going up towards a, a, a diagnosis, like the preparation of the, um, of the sample, but not including the, the actual uh, diagnosis. It seems right, honestly. It seems that what they're looking for is, is avoidance of that, that, that step, and that's, they're giving that enough weight to get you by the Supreme Court's holdings. Again, the Federal Circuit in the, in the, the most recent cases has just been incredibly frank in, in begging the court for clarity, and uh, I think it was stunning that they, they didn't get it this, this last round. So they do seem to be very interested in saying, great, present me anything but that method of diagnosis. If you can show me, great. We can let's prepare some intermediate, like like we were seeing in in uh, in the cells direct. We're preparing something. Yeah, I, I guess it's 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 new. It still has human human origins. I'm curious about the the myriad aspects, but they seem willing to look over that. Yeah. If you can take it that extra step and turn it into personalized medicine, where I've identified you a patient, and I'm now administering something to you, that seems to be enough. So another, uh, another question, what kind of uh, chilling effect has this um, legal situation had on the industry in the US? Is, is that noticeable or are people finding other ways to um, preserve their proprietary position or how is that being handled? It's a great question. I, I think you're seeing the creativity and claims you're seeing is those companies' efforts to stay afloat but I think it has hurt the industry. I think it has discouraged people from investing into tests like this. I think it has, has uh, hurt small companies that have been trying to build into that diagnostic space. And at the end of the day, I, I worry it's held uh, medicine back to a degree because of, again, just that unwillingness to invest and that will unwillingness to spend time and energy developing things that would not be protectable in the long run. I mean, for me, the encouraging uh, message from some of those cases was that as far as personalized medicines go, that where you've got um, the patient stratification step and the mm -hmm. treatment step, that's kind of what Vanda was, um, was telling us, that you can, you can get claims along directed towards those kind of technologies. Absolutely. And that's even using known classes, known drugs or classes of drugs. So it's not the effort to come up with a new molecule or a new compound or therapeutic. You just identify, great, here's a patient class that is suitable for this class of drugs or that, so we saw in the other set of claims, would not be suitable for this particular, particular drug. So give it to everybody else. Well, I mean, and that is a that is very valuable um, uh, innovation. I mean, if you look yes. at, uh, you take the case of antidepressants, normally people have to try you know two or three before they find one that that works for them and people people just don't know why people don't know why absolutely there's definitely a more more a lot of art there still i think and, and science is still catching up in a lot of ways okay we have a question here uh wonderful i think it's directed to you because it says uh, in the us uh, so in the us with diagnostic method claims that include a treatment step, like the one in, Van, in the Vanda case, are there treatments carried out by different people? Ah, good question. I'm just reading it here to catch up off reinforcement. Yes, and that's, that is a lovely, that's, that's a lovely nuanced question. Yes, and that can be difficult if you're, if you're trying to enforce against multiple infringers. And that is one thing that reduces the value of some of these claims. If you're looking to say, okay, who, it's easier in a method of, a straight up diagnostic method claim to say, great, I've probably got one infringer here. Where if it takes that additional method, the additional step of administration, does that then loop a prescriber into it? Are we talking about the patient themselves? Um, at the end of the day, it, 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 it is something that you can, you can enforce. Uh, there are other uh, options for structuring the claim as well, structuring the suit, I guess what I should say, as well. Say, well, fine, you, you didn't accomplish all the steps, but you are a, a contributory infringer and that you've, you've provided the, you've provided the, 
the, the drug that would, pardon me, provide it, the kit or the test that would, that would use all but this last step and that kit is, would, uh, is only usable to infringe my claims. So it's a good question. A divided infringement is, is hairy. Uh, it's, it's, it makes these claims not my preference at first. That's why, again, I'm still hoping we'll, we'll see legislative improvement here, but you do still have options. Yeah. Uh, life giving, life's giving us lemons, so let's make lemonade. Um, Absolutely. A, a, a more COVID-specific uh, question. So there's always two sides to, to the coin. So because there is um, uh, a lower number, presumably, of um, diagnostic patents being issued, does that make it easier to um, uh, to enter the market in, with a, for, for example, something that's not innovative but is just needed for um, for scale for the for the number of cases that are being um, handled? Uh, that's a fair question. I, and Adrian, I'm honest, interestingly, I'm honestly interested in your side too to see. I, I feel like we're seeing a, a surge in in new filings right now. Hmm. I feel like we're seeing a lot of activity in, in the space of diagnostics, diagnostics especially with COVID-19, uh, despite the case law. Uh, so I'm really curious what things look like in, in time as these begin to publish and, and get out. Yeah. Um, are you seeing similar? What, what yeah, 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 there's a, yeah, a lot Sorry. of activity on the diagnostic and um, therapeutic and medical device uh, side. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, diagnostics uh, is going to be, uh, you know, head and shoulders, uh, the most important uh, technical area, because you can imagine that it's going to be, you know, once we have point of care testing, that's going to be a yeah. right forward. And who knows, are, are people going to be required to have tests before they get on an airplane or do other certain kind of things? So I think the whole sector is, um, there's going to be unprecedented amounts of public and private money poured into it. Absolutely. Yeah. And the law, the law has to catch up. The law has to catch up. You know, when yeah. there's a, whenever there's a technological sea change, uh, the law is always um, is lagging behind. Absolutely. And that, that's what gives me hope. I'm, I'm hopeful it is as things calm down a little bit, that, the, that, that some focus will return to, hey, wait a minute, why didn't we have some tests, some of these tests that were easier to develop in the first place? Why didn't we have platforms ready? Oh, wait, there's this legal problem. So I'm kind of hoping the lens will turn back to that. And that's why, again, I'd, I'd advocate hedging bets at this point and including the disclosure of, of, of the diagnostic method in anything you file in the US with the hope that things will clarify and be fixed in time and if not let's look to finding ways that are things that are protectable about the method because there's so much value there there's so much value all right i think we're um just about run to time there lauren so um thank you very much that was a fascinating uh, over overview um, so thank you very much to all the um members of the audience as well thank you for the Europeans for giving up your evening. I'll let you get back to Netflix now. And thank you for uh, our US cousins. Uh, I'll let you get back to your lunch if you weren't eating as you were listening. So we will, we've recorded the webinar and we will um, send a link to the recording and uh, I'll stitch together my slides and Lauren's slides and we'll distribute those. So if you have any comments or questions, um, you, uh, I'll send out um, our email addresses so you can uh, get in touch with us. But um, I really enjoyed um, presenting with Lauren. It's a great pleasure. You're always uh, an, uh, an illuminating speaker. And um, thank you very much, everybody. And have a good evening and stay well. Thanks, Adrian. Be safe.